I'm a yoga teacher because I want to share a, a boyish wonder about being alive that also breaks my heart because we're not living that way. We're missing it. So I've got two things that lead me to want to share what I've been able to experience from both the practical world and the unseen world with people with all levels of ability. Thank you for being here. It's an honor. In my home. It's, it's nice to see you and talking with you always is very... Thanks for um, breakfast, by the way. Enlightening. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. So, how did yoga come into your life? Well, the very first um, memory or thoughts about yoga was my dad was in a couple of whiplash accidents, and so I was like four. And he had a book that my mom had gotten at a, a, at a, a garage sale for a dime. And it was a book from, well, this is 1972. And the book was really scary. Like it was, it had like nose clean, you know, coming out, know that, all these scary things. And, and my dad was trying to do some twists. He did stuff in the morning. He took out this little like mat and sat there with no instruction trying to help his back. But I used to, I used to watch him because it was before I was in school. So I used to watch him as a little kid. And I used to go and then he'd, fold up his mat and, his, and the book and put it in, the, in his closet. So I used, to, I used to go, when I wanted to get scared, I'd go <laughs> into his closet and I'd open this book and look at these crazy pictures going like. So, but that was enough context that when, you know, I was in a car accident when I was 13. So um, broke my back, so I'm paralyzed from the chest down. Did a lot of bunch of other stuff. But, um, <clears throat> and then when I was 25, I, I was really um, having, yeah, no, I was 23, 23. So I was having, um, you know, I just missed my body. I was in graduate school studying philosophy, being real in my head, um, and, and had basically been, been told to, the, par the paradigm, the medical, the medical paradigm had basically told me that all sensation was over below my point of injury, below my chest, and that really what I could do would be to, to overcome my paralyzed body, to learn how to get really strong with my upper body and learn to drag my paralyzed body through life. That was basically the vision. And, and, and that, for someone, I was a little kid that was very athletic, loved my body, loved doing all sorts of business from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. And so I was living this view of, of being, instead of having joy and, and fluidity in my body, I was living in my body as an object and at the same time um, thinking a lot. And I just hit a point where, my God, I had to do something different. And I was at, I was getting some, I was in a lot of chronic pain and was having the beginning of some shoulder problems. And I was with a body worker who said, why don't you try yoga? And I had just enough context from watching as a little boy to think, okay. I didn't really think, well, how is a paralyzed guy gonna do that? I didn't think any of those questions. I thought, oh, what the, you know, I wanna feel more connected to my body. And what better way than a, you know, ancient discipline that's been doing it for thousands of years. Do you know what that book was? Yeah, I found him. I still have it. I can't remember the name of it. I mean, it was like a sensationalized book. It was all, I mean, literally the pipe cleaners through the nose and all, all these crazy bandhas. And it wasn't whatever you'd want to teach anybody it really. Was the, the, it was the all the other stuff. But it was like, things. yeah, and it was like, you know, from 1971. And that was just enough to make me go to give it a try. And I got lucky because that body worker's first teacher, her teacher was an Iyengar teacher. Mm -hmm. And I don't think if I had encountered other than an Iyengar teacher, I don't think I would have been able to stick. And how do you show up at a yoga class in a wheelchair? She, she actually, M Maya was the, was the person that suggested it, had called Joe Zuzukovich um, in San Diego and said, I've got this guy. I think he should try yoga. I don't know how, if you can teach him. And Joe, I was living in Santa Barbara at the time, California in graduate school. Joe was in San Diego. And she would come up every six weeks to teach at this Aikido dojo. Um, <laughs> and so she just, Maya gave a, gave a call her and said, and I just showed up one day after class. And we just looked at each other and it happened. And how did this moment change your life? Um, so 
imagine like I had a this is a lot of what my book's about. So you're, you're asking me a question that you know I took a couple hundred pages to answer. So, but um, imagine that I had been told that there wasn't really any sensation possible for my whole body, yet I had had sensations, and the doctors had told me that what I was feeling in my lower body and from my chest down was phantom feelings, mm -hmm. as if my legs were amputated and I still felt they're there even though they weren't. So I had this sensibility, this sense, and this hum, and this feeling that that wasn't true. And I even told the doctors when I was 13, but they overwhelmed me with their paradigm of what sensation was. And, and, and so what happened, and so I kind of put it away, but I didn't forget. And so when I first met Jo, and she had me do a couple of little things with more precision, and more alignment. One of them was in prayer. And I remember, I remember like her going through some of the instructions and let, you know, and feeling this stuff. And I could feel something like a memory, but I could feel the, it go down my legs. Was it a the grounding sense? No, I actually think it happened. And, and right. so, but so it reawakened this level of sensation that I was convinced wasn't there. And at that point, I knew. And then she also, and the other, other real pivotal point, I got out of my wheelchair and I took my legs wide in Upa Vista Kanasana. And I remember it being very loud and very emotional. And I got choked up and I couldn't figure out why. And then I realized that I, I was 20, I was 20, no, I was 25 at the time. Um, I realized that I hadn't had my legs wide in 12 years. Because why would anyone with paraplegia take their legs wide. What's the functionality of that? And how would you do that in a wheelchair? Right, and, 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 and what I realize now is that to live in your whole body is your birthright. And that part of why I teach the way I teach and try to teach all levels of mind-body relationships without trying to fix them. See, I'm not interested in trying to find someone with cerebral palsy or with spinal cord injury and trying to fix them. I'm interested just to try to help them be a yoga student, mm -hmm. help them feel the principles, especially of anger yoga, because I'm an anger teacher, but to feel what happens when you inhabit your body. Well, at one point, you even thought, like as a child, you wanted to, you thought about amputating your legs. Yeah, no, when, that, was, that was a scene. When I was first trying to figure out my life and the doctors say, well, they're, they're just something I have to manage, I thought, well, if I have to get my upper body really strong, why don't I lighten the load mm -hmm. and ampute, have my legs amputated so I can get around easier? And they told me I was crazy. Aren't you glad that you didn't? I'm pretty happy I didn't. Because now yeah, you yeah. have them. No, no, and, totally. And, and you, mm -hmm. they're there, and the energy is there, and you can still mm -hmm. you feel your legs. Yeah, in and a the different doctors way. doctors tell you that you don't feel Yeah, it's just legs. different than, you know, it, yeah, I had to expand my, uh, my, my definition of what sensation was, mm -hmm. right? And recognize that mind-body sensation is possible. It doesn't just have to be meditation. That, Asana is actually still available through the principles of Iyengar Yoga in particular, I would say. Um, a level of sensation is transcendent of a severed spinal cord. And there are, if you listen and you, you know, one of the advantages and obviously great disadvantage that I have as a yoga student is that I can't do all the poses. I can't feel all the same things you can feel. I don't have outer body sensation. Mm -hmm. Right? This, I don't feel it there. So I don't have outer body sensation. But I have another level of sensation that comes from alignment and precision. All those things about alignment, right? Alignment is an effortless form of mind-body integration. Turns out that gravity or whatever it is travels through the bones, right? And when you get it more lined up, that level of... When I sit up straight here like this, I can feel the inside edge of my left heel better than if I'm back like this. Well, the same thing is true for you. Right? As you change the, the yeah, and you, and you know, the weight, the, right? And gravity goes, whoop, and you get it down and you feel more connected. Mm -hmm. You feel that on your outer body, but you also are having an experience on your inner body that's harder to hear and harder to feel. But imagine you got that outer body sensation stripped away. And what, what, what remains is this other level of sensation. It's the hum, but the hum actually can be directed or realized through paralysis. That's part of why I'm a yoga teacher. So if I took a razor blade and went like this on your leg, you wouldn't feel it? Mm, not right away. So like when I, 
you know, like when I've had injuries, I will feel like when I broke my femur bone, and I did, I did that doing yoga. <laughs> it's an advanced um, variation of Padmasana. I was like a, about two years into my yoga practice. You can, that tells you I was an athlete, right? I was being a little aggressive with the poses. <laughs> I, tell, I, say, I say to myself, I, I broke my leg so my students don't have to, right? So I, I recognize some things about nonviolence. <laughs> but like where I didn't feel it like the slice right away, but I could feel the overwhelming holistic dissipation of energy, the loss of direction. So. Like imagine I say in waking, I talk about breaking the femur bone as like a downed electrical line. Like the connection to my feet, right? the connection to my feet got exploded. And it was so, I felt like someone was hanging on the inside of my eyes. And I was like, like getting smaller and smaller. So, you know, but that level of sensation isn't really helped by pain medication. So I didn't take morphine, but I would say I was in excruciating pain. Now a deep cut, is not, I'm not gonna feel it like this, but I'm gonna feel the, the dissipation of the, the vulnerability and the heaviness of being violated like that. So it's a whole, again, it's a whole other realm of sensation that we don't quite have language for. Well, I think that you have a much better understanding of, 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 of your body than I do. Because in some ways, in some ways it. not. I mean, again, I have, I have, I have like I have an experience of, if you think about what it is to live in a paralyzed body. So when you say like, how did you start yoga? How, first of all, when I met Joe, it made me realize that this whole other realm was actually here and it was practical. It, it, it could be utilized in, in various ways. Um, but, and, and confirmation of that was a really big deal. But the, the if you think about so what I started to do, instead of being told, the doctors told me you have no sensation below your point of injury. And instead of doing that, instead of paying attention to that, I started to go, okay, instead of being told that it's not here, why don't I actually listen to the experience of paralysis? Not what it's like to be a paralyzed person, because that's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. Living out in this world, like we just know, like I tried to use the restroom, the bathroom door is too narrow. I just peed in her, in her kitchen, it's fine. It all worked out, right? That's all good, right? That's what it's like to be a paralyzed person. And, and you don't have to feel guilty about that. I don't. That's, that's, how the, that's how architecture is, right? Right, so that's what it's like to be a paralyzed person. But the experience of paralysis is different. And, and listening to what it actually was, what it is to have, uh, this, what it is to live in a body that you don't get to have control over in the same way. So the experience of paralysis, of having a severed spinal cord, is, is, is more like, what is it to be, have human consciousness without control or effort? Like, it's like what it is in itself. Now, if you, th that has its own sensation. So I would say that on some level, within my paralysis, I feel the inner aspect of presence where my will or my control doesn't have say in the same way. Mm -hmm. And when you recognize that, it's an incredible teacher. And you know what's fantastic about anger yoga? Is that it turns out that that level of presence that somehow is what precedes your ability to control it it turns out to be affected by alignment. So when, if I just hold my arm like this, I don't feel my legs. When I turn and roll it in and drop my shoulder blades some, awareness goes, energy goes right, or whatever it is, goes right down through my inner thighs, down to my feet. It's this hum that you're talking about. Right, and it gets to get more clarified. It's like imagine the hum's kind of messy and then all of a sudden it gets more clarified, which is exactly what happens when you come into alignment, right? Mm -hmm. That is what it is. So I'm hearing that kind of clarifying sensation of alignment without getting all caught up in trying to physically do it just right. Because mm -hmm. I can't physically do all the complexity that, that the Angar system can show you about how to do, even down to the fibers, right? But I can feel the more, the more basic movement I wouldn't know. I don't even know how to say it. Maybe, you know, maybe prana follows through the bones more than it does through the muscles and ligaments. It's one of the things I often say. Like, I don't know exactly know how to describe the experience, 
but I know it's real. And I also know I can teach it. I can teach it to anybody, this level of sensation, and it's a transcendent level of sensation, and it is in the anger system. How did you become an, uh, uh, an Iyengar teacher? Well, I studied for a long time, and then <laughs> You my, my practice a long time. I practiced for like, you know, I never lived in the same town as my primary teachers, which would be Joe Zukovich and Manusa Manos, and then Mary Dunn some um, near the end of her life. But um, I never, I never, I never lived in the same city. Mm -hmm. So I would see, have bursts of contact with my teachers as opposed to, and then have to go home and practice. Like it might be months. Mm -hmm. You know, so I had to like explore. I would get an insight. I would have to explore. And, but it would also come out of like the text. Like I remember there's a line that completely changed my life um, in Tree of Yoga from Bikas Ingar. He writes something, and I'm going to paraphrase it. I'm not going to get it right probably. But you only need two things for a yoga pose, a center of gravity and a sense of direction. I remember reading that going, well, for one, that's really good news if you're paralyzed. You preach that a lot. Right, 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 right. <laughs> that, like, like, that's really good news if you can't, if you don't have muscular action or control over some of your muscles. But exploring the depth of such a simple utterance, that's what I think that, you know, there's all the, there's all the beautiful precision and learning how to do all the poses. What is sometimes missed, I think, is the depth of some of Bikas Engar's very simple utterances. You kind of, because you're so caught up in the poses, you don't think, well, that's an interesting line. Yeah, that's true. But I've had to take lines like that and try to turn them over for 20 some years mm -hmm. and like realize that they never stop informing me. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the, you know, some of those basic lines like that. I mean, his translation of one of the sections of the sutras where he just says, when effortful effort becomes effortless, you've encountered the fourth method of pranayama. If you think about what you've, you've been in class with me, I'm really thinking a lot about that mm -hmm. and like trying to pass on an effortless form of sensation while acting, while being active, that can transcend someone's ability to, um, if they can't muscularly act. For example, um, let's say you're sitting in Dandasana. I remember this is one of the things that I used to, I've been in Dandasana a lot. I can sit on the ground, my legs can be straight in front of me. And trying to figure out how to roll in the inner upper thighs. Like, how am I going to do that? I'm looking down at my legs. It's like, I can't physically do that. Except I trust the lineage, right? I trust that when, if you can get this to go down and presence to move that way, that you're going to feel a natural lift, mm -hmm. right? And there's a principle. You have to go down to go up, right? And that sitting up on a lift and changing gravity and then having the gravity roll my thighs in so although I couldn't do the muscular action, I could feel the downward energy from gravity, which caused a very subtle lift up through my torso, which then when I got that, I could feel presence go out through my heels. Mm -hmm. And then I've just incorporated, now we have, you know, it's great with our adaptive students, we have someone put their foot into someone's sacrum, who's got like a spinal cord injury, so they can feel the change of gravity on their sits bones, so they can get the lift in their chest, so they can feel the outward and then I talk to them about muscular action that they can't do, but then they can feel the pose. I think it's amazing how you're able to teach the poses from the inside out, where typically, you know, for those of us that are dense in our bodies, it, we start from the outside in, and that this is much more advanced work in my, in my, yeah. in my book. Well, you know, by the way, I'd never call someone dense, right? <laughs> it turns out that when you have more control over your outer body, you forget that the poses are received, mm -hmm. not performed, mm -hmm. or you don't realize the depth of that you are participating in congruence when you're doing an asana, right? And but because you, if you have control of your outer body, you're getting there by being able to do very precise, complicated actions. You get confused about your thinking. The actions are creating the congruence, and they're not. I think that's what he meant by sense of direction. Mm -hmm that you can realize a sense of direction in a pose without being able to muscularly act. Well, that is, I mean, I'm getting, I get tingly just thinking about the depth of that truth right now in this moment. Like, I can't believe what he uncovered with that utterance. 
And the fact that I can teach the inside of poses that I can't fully do, that I can only do pieces and parts of poses, but that's the beauty of the Angar system. Mm -hmm. He reveals the universe in the smaller action, the parts of the poses, and then shows you how they go throughout the whole body. So I can get glimpses of the entirety by doing some of the precision, like working on a microcosm, not just of a singular pose, but of a part of a singular pose, and start to feel what he was trying to convey, I think, right, about the full body pose. That, there is no other system of yoga that is going to be able to show you at that level how a little action is the universe when it comes to yoga realization. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, He's the dude, right? I mean, he's, you know, I'm in awe. And though I've never met him, he's with me all the time still. I can hear him. I mean, not I can hear him, but I can feel his wisdom mm -hmm. around everything I do. Well, I remember taking a class with Patricia Walden at the Yoga Journal conference with you, and I was, you know, next to you. Mm -hmm. And we're doing handstands in Pinchamayrasana. And you were right there doing whatever it was that we were doing, whatever little intricacy that she was, she was teaching or having us do. And, and, and I was so inspired by watching your practice, you know, knowing that whatever little detail that she was talking about in the arm or in the, and, and whatever it was, I don't even remember what it was, but you were right there. And I don't think that there is any other system in the world where you and I could take the same class in the same room and be able to be in a state of yoga. I would, I would agree in, 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 in being able to be with the whole asana. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's an energy that's created by any yoga class. But one of the things that's so incredible about, I guess I'm, I'm about to say something I've never quite said, so I haven't, don't know if this makes sense. But there's the action and then there's the consequence of the action or, or how the action, what it creates. And one of the things that's more evident in my practice is that you can, even if you can't do the action, you can learn from the consequence of the action, mm. right? So like if you're pushing down through your inner heels and say you're teaching me and I would go, well, where else do you feel that? And right, like what's the, what's the result of that? And I'm able to grasp the result of actions without being able to do the actions, but everyone does and can. So, but I have to learn that way. So, so I think that when she's teaching something really, really intricate, like, you know, you know, something about the feet or the arms or in, in um, let's say, shirsasana, getting grounded, you know, making sure the wrist and the meat of the forearm are actually getting really grounded. Well, I can feel what that would do in my spine, right? So I don't have to get focused on whether I'm doing it just right here. I can go, wait. That instruction is to like make the energy of my spine move through my entire body, and then it starts to make sense. So in a way, I have to hear the subtle echoes of the instructions, and then move t from that towards the instruction, and realize the instruction. Does that, if that make sense at all? Totally. Okay, good. <laughs> that helps, makes me feel less crazy. No. Did you ever think that you were crazy when the doctors were saying, no, you're not feeling anything? That's not possible. No. Or you just didn't Not crazy. Them. No, think about it. You're young. But, you know, you just... Unfortunately, it's an all-too-common experience to be disempowered. For everybody. You know? That somehow what you're experiencing isn't relevant. And too many of us give that up too soon. So one of the opening lines of, of waking is, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking for answers. Rather, I'm trying to b believe in and appreciate my own experience. So that line is when I started trying to listen to paralysis, right? What was I experiencing living in a mind-body relationship which had a severed spinal cord? What's the ex total experience of that as opposed to being told what that experience is by someone who's not experiencing it? Right? And, and, and listening to that level, and then recognizing that believing in your own experience doesn't make you right. That's a hard, our culture doesn't get that one as much. But like, just because I, I know that I'm having sensation doesn't mean I know exactly how yoga poses go. 
Just because like I have my own experience doesn't make me an expert. It makes me have my own experience and then I get to appreciate lines like you only need two things for a yoga pose. I mean that center of gravity in Dandasana, getting the right positioning on your sits bones create or, or reveals the movement of energy down the legs. If you're just slightly back, you're going to fall the wrong way and the, the energy of the spine is going to fall back through the back body. So there's this really delicate place in the pose that that's what I have to listen for is where that place is. And then it turns out once you start to hear it or feel it, you can feel it even when your body isn't perfectly aligned, which is how I teach people with like severe cerebral palsy. They're never going to get right on their sits bones, but you can help them see and feel what that sensation would be like, and then you can teach it. So why did you choose to become a yoga teacher? Iyengar Yoga revealed and confirmed um, an unseen world that is relevant to living. So like, I say it more, more with laughter, like, it bakes my noodle every day that there's a way to make this tangible. The subtlety, the what you can't quite see, all the things that happen and make yoga so beautiful. So I'm a yoga teacher because I want to share a, a boyish wonder about being alive that also breaks my heart because we're not living that way. We're missing it. So I've got two things that lead me to wanna share what I've been able to experience from both the practical world and the unseen world with people with all levels of ability. And you do that very well. That's the hope. So what is yoga beyond the asana practice? Well, part of my practice and, and realizing that not, you know, the, the anger system reveals, I mean, we get so caught up in the doing of the poses, but don't forget, it's to reveal something about being alive and connected to existence. And that's the part that, in a way, has to be true if I'm able to participate in yoga, right? That it can't just be about doing the pose just right. That something else is being revealed by Angar Yoga. And one of the reasons why I go out there as an Angar teacher and teach whoever wants to come is to let them see and experience the breadth and depth of what I think he was revealing. There's multiple levels of any genius and, and there are multiple stories going and that I'm able to have gotten as much out of Iyengar Yoga tells you that he was up to so much and that he made room for everybody. Not just because therapeutically he could try to fix me he made room for me as a seeker. And that's... Genius. I think one of the many ways to describe yoga is being able to yoke what you can feel and control with what you can't feel and can't control and yoke them together in coordinated movement. Acceptance. No. How do you gather more of yourself besides your muscular action? How do you access the inner body, for example? How do you bring together those things in the performance of a movement? So, like for example, more back body presence mm -hmm while you're doing something very active with your front body? How do you gather more of yourself? Because you can't quite control 
You know, when, when Pika Sangar says something like, I've heard, I haven't been around him, um, like, you know, maybe we should do more yoga with more awareness of our bones. Clearly, you don't get to control the bones the same way. So what is he saying? Like, what are, what, and you can practically do some things to have your bones do more, right? But like, that's already accessing more of you that you wouldn't necessarily think about. What do you mean, do put yoga with my bones? Well, of course you, you know. So it's being able to, the things you don't get to control as much, bring them into union with what you can control. So there's more of you in the performance of whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense at all? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you're going to leave me thinking and contemplating about a lot of what you're talking about. And so I think someone with PTSD is actually injured in the unseen part of their dimension. Mm -hmm. And so a, a, a vet wants to will his way or her way through healing. And really, he's injured on the part, or she's injured on the part of the mind-body relationship that they don't get to control. So it's a big issue because they don't get to heal it the way they know how to be. So we got to help them be a different way and be more open to what they don't get to squeeze, right? And that's happening in every asana, right? So that's why asana is such an amazing thing to try to get those people to do because you start, without having to think about PTSD, you start having to open to more parts of what's happening and you're, by default, healing the part of you that got injured in the unseen part of the mind-body relationship. As a side effect. Trust the yoga gods. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got to do. You're doing a workshop tomorrow on post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm not a psychologist. I'm a yoga practitioner that's lived through a lot of trauma. Um, had post-traumatic stress, I wouldn't say disorder, but I've had flashbacks. I've had experiences of, of memory supervening into the present that are relatively remarkable, right? I've worked with people for a long time with all sorts of trauma loss disability. So what I'm more interested, you know, and this happened to me in the medical model too. When we, feel so, when we see someone who's injured or afflicted with something, we try to help, and we want to help so bad, we do things to them. So there's a lot of stuff out there, which is really good stuff, about how maybe we can re-stimulate the vagus nerve, and you can help the parasympathetic nervous system, and all this stuff. And there. But there, you know, remember, I'm the guy who was a kid that was told I couldn't feel anything. And nobody helped me come home to my body until I practiced Sangar Yoga. So I'm more interested tomorrow in trying to help teachers realize the commonality they have with anyone. We all have post-traumatic stress. We all have memories from the past that can come and supervene on the present. What's different for us is that, is that we can keep track of where the present is. And someone with post-traumatic stress or with Alzheimer's is losing track of the present, mm -hmm. right? So I'm more interested in helping teachers know how to meet and be with someone. Because we've got to help people come home from trauma, even though their life is never going to be the same, right? And, and so I'm more interested in not trying to figure out what to do to people with post-traumatic stress. You're not trying to fix them. Right. I want to help them feel like there's room for their story. And I'm not, as a psychologist, I mean like literally let, I'm not afraid of their suffering. We got to help teachers not be afraid of the immense suffering that's coming through the door. Mm -hmm. And learn, try not how to fix it, but how to be with it. And then let the power of yoga, the yoga gods, do what they do. How can you create strength? for example, underneath the experience of vulnerability. Isn't that what a standing pose is doing? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what an inversion is doing? We're helping people stay grounded and be open at the same time. So someone with PTSD, for example, is having a really hard time being open to this empty space in the room, to all these things. And so there's a level at which I want to try to convey in the workshop that we have to meet somebody coming through the door 
not be afraid of their suffering and let connection and humanity be what does the teaching, not should they do this pose or that pose exactly. More trust the beauty of yoga in dealing with it. And know some things you shouldn't do and should do. There are, there are some things. There are some but I'm more interested in making sure, like when Joe Zukovich and Manuso met me as a yoga student, who I was in that moment, and then helped me experience yoga, right? That's what I want to get people better at doing with something like PTSD. I remember there's a line that completely changed my life. Um, in Tree of Yoga from Bika Singer, he writes something, and I'm going to paraphrase it, I'm not going to get it right probably, but you only need two things for a yoga pose, a center of gravity and a sense of direction. I remember reading that going, well, for one, that's really good news if you're paralyzed. You preach that a lot. Right, 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 right. <laughs> that, like, like, that's really good news if you can't, if you don't have muscular action or control over some of your muscles. But exploring the depth of such a simple utterance, that's what I think that, you know, there's all the, there's all the beautiful precision and learning how to do all the poses.